Okay, welcome along everyone to this uh, latest in the SILIP Scotland online learning. Um, today's one is about climate beacons and SILIP School Green um, as part of our, our wider SILIP School Green work we representing this. Uh, I'm Sean McNamara, Head of SILIPs, and I'll be doing some of the, the, the housekeeping today just, just to keep you right um, before we, we formally start the, the event. Uh, so just to, to let you know, as you've come in, you'll have noticed your, your mics are off. If you can, keep them off. You know, when we come to questions at the end, we might ask you to, to, to un, unmute if possible but but we may just just uh, not, not need that so just keep the keep that off just to stop any background noise if any of you turn them on accidentally we'll we'll, we'll mute you anyway so, so don't worry about that feel free to turn your camera on if you want if you if you'd like to, to have it on that's absolutely fine but equally you can leave it off if you prefer uh obviously if you have any bandwidth issues usually we say you know turn it off because that can sometimes uh, save them when when we get that unstable connection warning we're going to have, have three speakers today and we're, we're going to come to the questions at the end of all three of them. But throughout all of the talks, any questions you have, if you just put them into the chat function, then we will come to the end. If you can mark them with a queue, just so, so that, that when I'm, I'm doing the Q&A at the end, I can just spot what are our questions. Put a queue for a question, a C for a comment, if you can remember to do that, and we'll, we'll come to them all at the end. Um, so yeah, use the chat function throughout um, and hope you enjoy this. I'm now going to pass on to my colleague, Kirsten McCoy, who's, who's going to uh, introduce the speakers. Thank you so much, Sean, and thank you so much for being here, everybody. As I'm sure you know, COP26, the UN Climate Change Conference, is just around the corner for Glasgow, Scotland and the whole world, and it is a real delight to come together to learn about the unique essential role that libraries are playing in supporting sustainability. So as Sean has mentioned, we've got three incredible speakers who are generously sharing their time and ideas with us today. They're Kathleen Milne from Western Isles Libraries, Alison Nolan from Inverclyde Libraries, and Pamela Tulloch, CEO from the Scots, uh, of the Scottish Library and Information Council. So thank you so much to you all for being here. And we're going to start with you, Pamela. I'm sure Slick need no introduction to a library-loving audience like this. And hopefully many of you are already aware that Slick are championing this vital role that Scotland's libraries are playing in climate action. And we're going to hear exactly how they're going about that now. So whenever you're ready, Pamela, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you. So you're just on, on mute, Pamela. There we go. Um, well, good morning, everybody. Um, I'm just going to bring the slideshow up for you uh, from the beginning here. There we go. So hopefully you can all see the slides. Um, first of all, a huge thank you to Sillips for inviting me to come along and speak this morning. Um, it's a great privilege to be here and to see so many of you virtually or to see your names anyway virtually. Um, I apologise in advance for the comment I'm about to make some of you will have heard me make it before, but as you know, Slick is claiming libraries as the originators of the sharing economy. So while we're talking about libraries going green, libraries have always been green. And it's very fitting that I think we're actually stepping up now and um, taking the climate debate forward. Um, so what I'm, I'm really wanting uh, to give you this morning is a very brief overview of some of the ways in which um, Slick is championing that case. So as, as some of you will be aware, uh, Slick published a new public library strategy forward uh, at the end of August this year, and it is very much rooted in um, sustainability. Um, forward um, is five year strategy, and at the heart of all its strategic aims are the United Nations 2030 Sustainable Development Goals. So we're absolutely claiming libraries as being at the center of the, the um, sustainable agenda. And we're very much putting it out there as to how they do that in all the various different ways that libraries contribute to local communities and services. But the strategy itself is rooted in people, place and partnership. And really the combination of those three is what is going to bring the climate debate to life for Scotland. So it's really um, important that we, we don't lose sight of that. You know, climate is all about people. It's all about place. It's especially about place and, and partnerships are going to be what, what makes it happen. 
Slick has been working with its partners um, over recent months to really highlight climate um, in, a, in a range of ways. So I want to um, touch on these briefly um, right now. Um, I'm going to kick off with Climate Tales, which is an initiative from BBC Scotland or Radio, BBC Radio Scotland. Um, it's a children's writing competition and it invited children over the summer um, to write, or early in the year rather, to write 500 words about what climate means to them. And that could be a rap, it could be a song, it could be a poem, it could be a short story. And we saw over 500 um, entries um, arrive at BBC Scotland uh, to be considered. However, BBC Scotland, having worked with Slick for a good number of years now, um, understood the expertise that libraries and librarians bring to literature and literacy, and they invited um, librarians and library staff to take part in the judging process. So over the summer, we had over 60 librarians and uh, members of library staff from right across Scotland, from Shetland to the borders, um, reading the entries that had come in and whittling them down to a short list. Um, and I think what that really shows was, you know, it was all done digitally, so it, it meant the country could come together much more closely um, and the network of library staff could come together much more closely to work on a common theme, but also, you know, really building on the, the expertise that, that they have to bring to that conversation. Um, the winning entries are going to be displayed at the COP26 Blue Zone site, so that's the official site at the north side of the Clyde, um, and again making sure that young people's voices are very much part of the whole um, the whole experience at COP. So we're absolutely delighted to be taking part in that. And um, what I can see is we don't know what the winning entries are right now. They're going to be announced on Saturday, the 23rd of October. So if you watch out for both BBC Radio Scotland and BBC Scotland, you will uh, hear who the winners are and where they're from and what they've won, etc. But sticking with partnership, I think one of the real um, strengths about the whole climate debate and climate conversation is it has brought both the cultural sector in Scotland and the climate um, agencies in Scotland much closer together. And one of those um, examples uh, I'm going to uh, focus on here is COP Conversations. Now, COP Conversations are a uh, um, it's a, a collaboration between SLIC, Museums and Galleries Scotland, and Historic Environment Scotland. And a fund was brought together to um, enable libraries, um, historic environment organisations, and museums to apply for funding to hold conversations um, during the, the, well, really the next month or so, you know, during COP itself or, or in and around COP. And I think it's, it's, been a, a great example of collaborative working within Scotland's cultural sector. Um, it's ensured opportunity for all because um, museums, libraries, historic environment organisations from right across Scotland were eligible to apply for it. It's enabled conversations to take place locally, so it, you know, people are not having to travel to Glasgow to have these big conversations, or local conversations for that matter, but they can hap happen in, in, in right across Scotland and people's uh, communities. And I'm delighted to say that seven library services were successful in receiving funding for COP conversations. Um, and I think Alison may, may correct me uh, later when she's speaking, but I think Inverclyde have kicked off already with their COP conversations. We've yes, also... <laughs> <laughs> <That's> Alison. <laughs> um, and, um, We've also been working again with Museums Gallery Scotland on a new website called Culture at COP. And this is an online events uh, forum. Anybody, you know, you, you're all free to upload any events or initiatives that you've got and, and put it out there for, for everyone to see. Libraries can take part, so we are encouraging people to upload content to the Culture at COP website. Um, it's not exclusive to Scotland, so people from, from further afield can upload events as well. And I think we're hoping to see, you know, just the whole kind of culture and climate um, 
actions that have been taken place captured in one place. So it's a call to action for those of you on the call if you've not already come across culture at COP. And then Climate Beacons, which is, is why you're all here to hear about the wonderful, wonderful things that are happening in the Western Isles and in Inverclyde. Um, Climate Beacons, I feel, is, has been an um, initiative that really has um, been a true collaboration, and it's not, it's not often that, that you, can, you can feel that. Um, it's a, a partnership between, which is led by Creative Carbon Scotland, which are an excellent organisation. If you've not already come across them, please look them up. Um, so it's a collaboration with Creative Carbon Scotland, Architecture and Design Scotland, Museums and Galleries Scotland, the Edinburgh Climate uh, Change Institute, Creative Scotland, the Sustainable Scotland Network, and SLIC. And there was an, an open call for applications from uh, communities right across Scotland um, to bid to be a climate beacon um, during COP and beyond. Um, and it was a, a very, very, um, very high standard of applications that came forward. I was privileged enough to have been on the, the judging panel for it. And I mean, you know, it, it just blew my mind, the amount of, of, of things that are happening and that are going to happen um, during COP that actually shines a light on culture and climate. Um, but there was only only a budget to fund um, seven of them, and I'm absolutely delighted that two of these have libraries right at the core of them, and, and we're lucky enough to hear from them this morning. Um, so it is very much about bringing culture and environmental groups together. They're rooted locally, and it is very much um, you know, about focusing on, on the local issues and what that means to local communities. But these beacons do have a global reach, um, and they really are amplifying the message about culture and climate in Scotland um, to a very, very um, broad audience. So um, I think, you know, they're obviously very, very proud that um, Inverclyde and Western Isles Library Services are um, rooted in, in two of the, the beacons, but I'm sure libraries will be involved in the other five as well. So SLIC um, is very much about, we're on a journey uh, with climate, we're, we're out there, we are talking about it, we are working with partners on it. We've all also published um, a list of climate resources on our website for anybody who would like to um, look at them or, or see what's out there, see what we're promoting. Um, but we've also got um, a climate base camp group on the go where we're posting a lot of opportunities for, for library staff and library services. So if people are not already registered as part of that climate base camp group, please, please um, drop us a line and we'll, um, we'll, we'll certainly get you um, logged into that. I'll put the, our email address in the chat so you, if you want to follow up, you've got somewhere to follow up with. And without much further ado, I'm just going to pass back to Kirsten and uh, join the rest of you with listening to Kathleen and Alison. Amazing, Pamela. Thank you so much. And thanks to Slick for all the incredible stuff they're doing to just place libraries right at the heart of these conversations in this dialogue where it's very clear that they belong. I feel like we need to transform our hashtag now. I think Silips go green. I think libraries are green, but they always were and they always will be. I love it. Um, so yes, if you do have any questions um, for Pamela, please do pop them in the chat and then we'll come to as many as possible at the end. But you've given such a wonderful introduction to our climate beacons. I think we shall move straight ahead and we're going to begin with Kathleen and we're going to hear more about the incredible activities and advocacy the Western Isles Libraries are doing as part of the Outer Hebrides COP26 Climate Beacon. So whenever you're ready, Kathleen, over to you. Thank you. Just trying the whole screen sharing. One second. There, I hope you can see that. Beautiful, thank you. Thank you. Oh, well, anyway, thanks. Thanks for that lovely introduction. And thanks to, to you and Sean and Silips for inviting me here today. It's, it's a real pleasure to talk about this project. Um, 
I just wanted to talk about this this main slide, uh, which I have to say the outline was stolen very much from the Syllabus graphic that you created to to promote this activity. But the the photograph is one I took when I was recently in Vatasi uh, to um, visit one of the libraries, and it's of the Maka. And I just happened to be in Barra and Vatasi when the the Maka was just blooming. And I think it's a reminder of, of climate change. It's a really um, rare a sort of um, sort of ecosystem which is along the coastline on the west of Scotland and Ireland. And it's it's sort of most at risk uh, of climate change and changes in sea levels. So I thought it was just an interesting thing thing to have as as a reminder of what the impacts are. Um, so as Pamela mentioned, uh, we're really honoured to be one of the, the seven climate beacons uh, in Scotland. And it is very much a partnership uh, sort of a project. Um, sort of we are one of many partners along with some art centres and Lancia, Tykersova and Curlis. We have the sort of community planning a partnership with us as well as sort of represents from Nature Scott and Sniffer, which are sort of very involved in doing some studies locally. So, you know, all these groups were working in their own little fields and we're now sort of coming together uh, for this joint sort of ambition, which is really, really positive. So again, a photograph just to remind you of the terrible challenges I have as a librarian on the Western Isles. This was again a recent trip I did, but it, it, it was like once we got a beacon, it's like, what can we do? And we just thought, well, what, what libraries always do best? And it's a mixture of providing information, opportunities for engagement, um, creating conversations and stimulating conversations and just providing opportunities for people to get more more involved um, and again the the, the the start was the joy of putting some climate collections together we clearly had some books in stock but we were able to put some of the funding towards really extending our collections and the research for this was just a pleasure there are so many stunning books out there and we thought we'd got a big collection but when we split them between our libraries we realized how small it is and we'd actually like to have like sort of four times as much so every library could have one of these these extensive collections um but it's a start um there are some amazing books out there and it just was a reminder that you know we have to provide the information and make it easier for people to learn about the subject. We, I realized doing this project how I thought I was very aware and you know up to date, and I realized how little I knew. So it's made me realize that we need to be far more proactive, maybe, than we were. Um, again, this is a picture of. Dawnaway Library, we were very lucky to have a sort of empty corner and a relief staff member who happened to be an artist. So we've set up climate corners to feature our collections of books. Um, not all of them can be as big as this one, but um, in the smaller libraries, we are introducing sort of wee posters, which is the picture on the right there. And we're making sort of leaves available and encouraging people to write a sort of climate pledge or something, just one thing they will do to try and make a difference so that everyone feels not just sort of overwhelmed by the issue, but that they can engage with it and they can take part and make a difference. Uh, so we hope that our trees and all the libraries will be covered with these leaves uh, and people will be able to learn from other people's pledges. So we've got just two leaves there, simple pledges, but if everyone just does one thing, that, that can really make a difference. One of the real privileges of the Climate Beacon is for libraries to be put in touch with um, the sort of environmental organizations. And in our case, it was uh, 
sort of sniffer and nature scott and the community planning climate change group because they were in the middle of doing a pilot study in north uist uh which is they want to engage with the people they've got the science but they want sort of local people to share not only what they've observed that's changed in the in the area sort of small changes uh whether it's a result of worsening storms flooding water level rises landslides coastal erosion anything people have noticed locally over the years but also what their concerns are about the impact in the future how is this going to affect them getting to work are their homes at risk their livelihoods um, so it's a very personal mapping project and we were able to say well libraries are the perfect place to share this information so we've set up a sort of interactive table at Linnaclet Library for both the public and the school pupils to come in and discuss the issue and and share their, their, their thoughts and, and sort of knowledge. Um, as Pamela mentioned earlier, the COP26 Conversations Fund, and we were also really lucky to get that, and it helped support a series of, of sort of author talks for young people that we were uh, wanted to hold. It was seen the climate collections, there are so many fantastic children's books available that are really stimulating and interesting and empathetic and we just wanted a chance to to host those authors so we've already kicked off with Piers Torday who did um, an event a couple of weeks ago and it it was just brilliant and we're really looking forward to the rest so Piers Torday has written the last wild trilogy um, Hannah Gold the last bear Jill Lewis has done a whole range of fantastic books on, on animals and wildlife. And Dr. Emily Grossman has just done, oh, I can't even remember the title, Brain Fizzing Facts or World Whizzing Facts. And that sort of deals with climate change as well. So um, yes, these are in progress and I'm really excited about this. The only thing I can say now is just never do a Teams Live event, um, use any other format but Teams Live, please. Um, another thing Pamela mentioned is that this creates opportunities for partnership and the more we do, the more people we seem to be in contact with and discovering and people are sort of working together more and more. And the Fun Palace was a brilliant opportunity to do that. Again, we held that in Linaclid Library. Um, it's a particularly remote area, so it really brings people together. And it was lovely to see the library as busy as it used to be in sort of pre-COVID times, um, but still safe. And it, the whole day had a climate theme. We had an energy company there talking to people about, you know, sort of insulation and sort of how to improve the energy efficiency of their homes. But we had um, sort of a whole range of activities including the sort of mapping project which was happening there at the same time but it was a lovely way of bringing children and families to the maps and we got a huge amount of information you can see all the sort of posted notes on on the back map there on the left uh, but my particular favorite was when i was looking at all the comments at the end of it and there was one in the sort of east uist and back yellow area which just had dinosaurs on it so um yeah i'm not sure if sniffer and nature scott will be interested in that but i, I appreciated that one uh fun palaces also gave us the opportunity to host a live event um chaired by lewis who and involving uh mm -hmm. professor Marilyn Corrigan from Harriet Watt University, and this was funded by Explorathon. So that was a fantastic opportunity to talk to a specialist about how we can change our buying habits. Um, you know, but it was so sensible, it was practical, but you know, every area has its challenges and we can only do what we can do as long as we do what we can do. So it was a lovely opportunity to actually speak to the researchers 
and in language that everyone can understand. And I hope we can have more of those kind of opportunities in speaking to the scientists, but making it accessible for, for communities and individuals. Okay, another strand of the climate beacon is our sort of walks and talks strands, which again is sort of part supported by the Conversations Fund and, and the Climate Beacons and Book Week Scotland. So everything's coming together to, to support the sort of climate change awareness work. And we have Alistair McIntosh uh, is going to be doing a talk in November on his latest book, which is Riders on the Storm. And then Natalie Fee, who, again, I wasn't aware of her, but I started reading her book, which was fantastic, How to Save the World for Free. Um, so we're really looking forward to these author talks as well. Uh, for the walks, we, we're working with uh, University of Highlands and Islands and Stornoway Trust to develop a sort of family trail based around the Lewis Castle grounds. Um, it's a pilot. We sort of want to create a family friendly map of the area and then have related resources encouraging families to go and learn about the trees and the environment. And if we're successful here, we hope to maybe get more funding to replicate that in other areas instead of it just being based around Stornoway and Lewis. We'd like to have something in Barra and the US as well. Um, yes, and one of the partners for the Climate Beacons is Architecture and Design Scotland. And we were really thrilled when they um, agreed to help us with a design, a home and community for the future competition, which we're holding for primary schools and early secondary. Uh, and, and they were absolutely fantastic. They came up with a sort of spec and and sort of questionnaire for the children to complete and the challenges for them to design a home or community in the future for the future but thinking of what that place will need to either uh sort of yeah adapt to climate change but also lessen the impact and they can do this through minecraft lego cardboard artwork anything it was open to to all sort of talents um the closing dates very soon uh we may need to extend it but we're really excited to see what comes from this project and then a bit slower to get going uh we already have a project that's been going for some some years called steam ahead which is a sort of involving people with science technology you know the same topics but also the arts as well and those sort of involve Lego coding and design activities. So we want to develop a few workshops on climate change topics, but linking to how children and young people can actually uh, sort of follow up with Lego and coding and design. There are so many fantastic resources for pupils out there. There's keep Scotland Beautiful and Adaptation Scotland, there's so much, so we don't want to duplicate what's going on, but we hope to link it with maybe existing library activities as well and sort of just offer an addition to what's out there. And that's really sort of sort of the project in a nutshell. Um, we're trying to Again, libraries are green, but this has really made us think far more seriously about what we do every day. Um, we're trying to encourage our procurement to actually just go down only using sort of green paper uh, for, for the whole council. Easier said than done, as the cost of recycled paper seems to be four times the amount of ordinary, but I think this is something that all local authorities should really work towards. We've been contacting our book suppliers to try and find sort of alternative uh, to plastic book form, and we've uh, sort of purchased the bio book form ourselves to sort of process our own books. Uh, so we'll see how that goes. The real challenge, I think, is 
our library buildings are just so inefficient. Um, how do we work to make library buildings more efficient? They're not high on the priority list for councils. Um, and it would be really good maybe to, to source or look for funding to even retrofit LED lighting improvements. How, how can we improve and set an example for communities as well? I think that's a, a big question. And, and what can we do in the future? I think, as, as Pamela said, again, this is a journey. This is very much, this isn't just around COP26. This has to be at the heart of how we go forward. Um, it's something we need to embrace as one of our kind of core activities and make more information available to people and keep those conversations going. Um, yeah, so it's it's exciting. It's like exciting to be here at the beginning of this project and to to hopefully get more involved. We're already talking with Alison about what we can do plot for next year. So uh, yeah, I think this is only the beginning. So I think that is it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Plotting for 2022. I like it, Catherine. Yep. Plotting. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you so much. I thought I, I had a good sense of all that you're doing and it's just incredible the, the breadth and the depth as well and I love how engaged young people are in it and it seems to me like you're really making the most of what a library's natural role is that there hasn't necessarily been need, needed to be too much of an adjustment and that is already there making these connections spreading this knowledge and it's just wonderful to see thank you so much and we will share I know that on our Silver Green page we've got I think a couple of the self-adhesive eco-friendly yeah. wrappers and um, so I'll share that link in a second and people can have a look but we do need to keep our, our lobbying work up as well I think don't we yeah that's it it, it will come it will come it will, it will come it will come <laughs> so I think yes please do pop any questions for Kathleen in the chat we'll come to them as soon as we can and next we're going to hear from Alison so Inverclyde Libraries are an integral part of Inverclyde Climate Beacon and we're going to learn more about their inspired work which I think is really combining climate action with, with social justice, with community engagement, and we can't wait to hear more about it. So thank you so much, Alison, whenever you're ready. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Kirstine. I'll just scare, share my screen. Okay, hello everybody and thank you very much for inviting uh, me along today to talk about the Inverclyde Beacon. Um, just to tell you a little bit more about Inverclyde, we're a network of six public libraries uh, on the west coast of Scotland, including Central Greenock, South West, Port Glasgow, Kilmacombe, Gourock, Inverkip and Weems Bay. And we provide library services to anyone who lives, works or visits in Inverclyde, you know. So our beacon was formed with a partnership between um, ourselves, the Beacon Arts Centre, Belleville Community Garden Trust, Rig Arts and Inverclyde Shed, amongst others. And our focus, like Kathleen, is on the roles of climate change, mitigation and ad adaptation as part of Scotland's most economically deprived areas recovery from COVID-19. Um, so we saw working with the expertise of partners as an opportunity to embed new green practices into our work. So I'm delighted I'm delighted that Sue Williamson is on the call today because yesterday uh, the British Library did a wonderful uh, talk on public library and climate changes and sustainability and she spoke about the power of partnership and the power of convening and I think through what Pamela has spoken about and Kathleen and myself you can see how we're all working together and the power that libraries have to raise an issue like climate and to stimulate those conversations but also look inwardly as well and see how we can work together in order to make those bigger changes as well. So uh, moving on, why did we become a climate beacon? Um, well, pre-pandemic, um, we were very lucky to access the Public Library Improvement Fund and uh, develop libraries as cultural hubs in Inverclyde and look at alternative programming. So when we evaluated that particular uh, programme, we found that 
through feedback, local citizens felt that their culture based library is one that taps into the spirit of the community, assessing priorities and providing resources to support the things that they deemed the most important. Um, one important lesson that we learned during the pandemic was that community spirit and empowerment um, was really, really strong in Inverclyde, you know, um, and our communities rallied together to face the challenges that COVID threw at them. And I think this was a perfect opportunity for us to change the narrative. We did not want to be just known as the most economically deprived area in Scotland or the COVID capital of Scotland, which we, we were called at the beginning of the pandemic. We wanted to challenge and channel um, uh, all the community empowerment and resilience that had come, uh, come together um, from um, working uh, through COVID as well. And Inverclyde Public Libraries and the services they offered were havens for community members in times of uncertainty. And as I can echo Pamela's comment, you know, we are very we're nature by the uh, we're green by our very nature in that our resources are shared by the larger community and Inverclyde's delivery service, informal online programming and timely access to PCs and support for digital literacy when it was a priority for our community was crucial during uh, COVID-19. Um, we also had been involved with the Fun Palaces Network and, and I'll speak about that a little bit more um, prior to the pandemic so um, it was a natural progression um, to look at that. So climate beacon, what were we going to do as a climate beacon? So we thought there was two strands we wanted to look at. Recovery, okay, and as we recovered from COVID, we wanted to look at our programming. And the second thing we wanted to do is we wanted to look inward and we look, wanted to look and see what we could do ourselves um, uh, you know, to change the way that we worked and offer um, new ways of working. So how do we start? Our climate focused recovery uh, began with uh, our summer of fun um, and uh, we offered 32 uh, sessions both indoor and outdoor um, in our local parks and in our, our libraries and we were very lucky and blessed that Wild Wor World Heroes was the theme for the summer reading challenge. So a lot of our act activities involved climate themed story times and family litter picks which were a massive hit with, uh, with our our, our local population who knew um but anyway it was the, the first the start um of, of our conversations so again looking at our programming we decided we would look at what we already did so we looked at our chatty cafe uh, um, network and we said how can we change the programming here to make it green or to make it focused on our climate so we had a really successful gardening chatty cafe called blooms and bickies we thought we could build on that but also we saw during the pandemic that food security was huge so how could we tap into that community garden network and how could we develop further partnerships with hospitals, community centres and local citizens to create socially sustainable communities? So we, we looked at what we already did and then we saw how we could change it as well. So the first thing we did was with the Chatty Cafe Network is look at developing two new Chatty Cafes. The first one we looked at was our Chat and Change. Um, we were very lucky also to identify a piece of green space and we decided we were going to develop a reading garden. So we thought this Chatty Cafe could feed into that. So what we did was decide we would build into our, our partnership and see if our partners would come and speak um, at this chatty cafe to encourage the, the, the social interaction as well. So we were very lucky um, to get uh, one of our previous chatty crafters to come and talk um, to our group and explain how important it was to meet together to reduce social isolation and to help like-minded people um, come together and chat uh, and share interests as well and work for you know a, a common goal as well. So we also had um, Ranger John from the Clyde Muir Shield Regional Park and Erin from Broomhill Gardens come and talk. They spoke 
about how climate change affects wildlife and our nature reserves, again, all local, so they meant something to our communities. We spoke about how food miles were accumulated and how growing our own food can reduce our carbon footprints. And participants also played climate change bingo and took seeds home to give planting a go, which was wonderful. Uh, we also had just last week, um, this amazing group called the Literati Guide to Inverclyde. And again, they're at local activists who do a huge amount of work about around reducing, uh, reusing and recycling. And they organize litter picks in the local area. And they gave a really um, visual <laughs> um, uh, display of uh, the wonderful and weird collection of curios found on litter picks in Inverclyde. You'll see them there. There's dolly mixtures, which are, you know, pieces of dollies that were found. We have fast food fizzies. We've even got PPE, all sorts as well that have been picked up. But it just gave that visual representation that made sense to, to our people um, and, uh, and, and showed how working together within our communities, we can make that that change. We also ask Sally from Belleville Community Garden, who again is one of our, our beacon partners to come along and she spoke about how to grow your own food from off cuts and seeds, which was really, really uh, useful and helpful and well received. Our other second chatty cafe that we looked at was again, moving along from the, you know, the, the reuse recycle and upcycle um you know kind of agenda as well and um, we had a very successful chatty cafe during covid during lockdown and it was online it was a facebook group uh facebook group um of chatty crafters who worked on crochet um and gay mclean was our um provider a local crafter so we spoke with her and we said what could we do around this and she suggested why don't we do some junk journaling so again she said using everyday objects we can create junk journals they can either be displayed as artworks or also we can give them as gifts to other people as well and um, we kind of targeted some of our previous groups and said would you be interested in taking part and they were delighted they thought again a lovely unusual crafting projects that they could come and um, meet together and work on we also invited Karen Orr from Reg Arts who is another one of our Climate Beacon Park partners to come and talk about the work that they've been doing uh, around the Plastic Fantastic project and the importance of reducing reusing recycling and upcycling and then um, out of this kind of shared partnership and when we were advertising this particular chatty a, a, a cafe we were approached by another local um lady who runs the redeem exchange team and if you haven't heard of them they developed out of COVID as well, um, uh, with a simple yet innovative idea to reduce plastic waste in the shape and form of empty hand sanitizer bottles. So they offer a collect, wash, refill and return service for empty bottles to help save the environment. And that has been growing um, and they're looking at other, other um, recyclables at the moment um, as well. But their main hub was in our local area in Greenock. Um, so as they are growing, and um, they're going to work with other networks and open hubs throughout Scotland. Um, and this is also providing jobs for people living in SIMD areas. So again, it's tapping into that kind of green economy. So they've designed an employability program for those who, who join them and um, giving valuable skills and knowledge to reach uh, their full potential. So we're really excited about that partnership again, you know, that that we're building and they, they're approaching us um, to see how we can work together with them as well. So that's some of the adult pro programming. And as Kathleen mentioned with her collections, again, we did a lot of work around our climate collections and then we tapped into our programming for children. So we do a Libraries Inspire, which is um, a, a school's visit. Um, and again, we were doing virtual uh, during um, during the, the pandemic, um, which has continued at, at this moment with a kind of a blended uh, a version. And again, we uh, created climate collections that could go out to the schools and um, with a, a, a resource pack which uh, included a video 
Um, and we asked our carbon reduction officer for Inverclyde Council to create that video for us. Um, and then we gave lots of um, uh, learning materials so the classes could discuss what libraries meant to them, research COP26, design a climate friendly uh, library of the future. And again, these designs are going to be published in an ebook which will be available through our BorrowBox service as well. And we also gave them a practical guide to using the primary countdown to COP thing link as well and again as you can see there the schools are enjoying those resources as well and voting for their favorite climate books as well which we will display during um galoshans and book week scotland um uh, as well so again you can see how all our programming has a climate focus um galoshans festival is very unique to inverclyde it's coming up soon it's halloween it's just before cop it's run by rig arts which again are one of our partners um, and again their theme this year is um, climate focused as well so again everything we're working for is all tapping into that and everything is joining up beautifully so again um, we will do a display of our, our, our chatty uh, crafters work including the junk journals again we're tapping in to our VR headsets and having climate themed sessions to allow young people to explore the ice caps and coastlines from around the world and again, everything um, will uh, move towards that weekend and then on to uh, Book Week Scotland as well. We also were very much involved with fun palaces. Fun palaces had been instrumental when we've been investigating libraries as cultural hubs. So it was a no brainer when Lewis contacted us to see if we'd be involved again with a clear climate focus. So um, fun palace library challenge brilliant way to spark conversation. Our challenge this year was for Inverclyde residents, young and old, to share with us their hopes and dreams for the future in a climate stable world. So they could come up and plant a bulb pick a bulb up from their local library and plant the bulb in one of the custom planters we had at our branches or bring it home and we also allowed them to pick up a wee lollipop stick and write their dream and plant it with us uh, as well and then to share their pictures on on our social media profiles as well but what we also did was we got all our climate beacon partners to um, say that they were supporting our fun uh, palace library challenge so you'll see this lovely picture of Bruce Newland from Inverclyde Shed there with the with the sunflowers behind him um, and that was his little video he did to promote um, promote our challenge and if you haven't seen it already he has also produced a video for the Syllabus Go Green um, um, which is available on the website as well so please do have a look at that about the changes we can make in our, our libraries and looking at buildings because Bruce comes from an architectural background and you can see pictures of our, our young and old residents and um, taking part in that particular library challenge. Like Kathleen, we also had a climate researcher in residence as well. Um, um, and again, this is wonderful to, to have this because, again, we were discussing the research that's going on across Scotland to do with climate and climate related topics. But in the words that our communities can understand. So for us, it was the impact of community green spaces in connecting communities. Inverclyde has a huge um, community garden network, you know, um, and again, we've had those speakers from all those particular community gardens very much involved in what we're doing. So there was a really interesting discussion had um, around uh, the role that community gardens have and also uh, the role that libraries have as well in, in promoting and sharing knowledge and tackling inequalities. And we were very lucky to have Dr. Cheryl McGeekin and uh, Ian Shaw, um, who both work on the International Green Academy, which is a collective of researchers, teachers and young people working together to build school and community gardens. And their mission is to grow community uh, and school gardens into sites of student pride, outdoor learning and community engagement. And also we had Fraser Stewart and he's a PhD student in the School of Government and Public Policy. And he discussed his research on the impacts of in renewable energy systems on poverty and inequality and how community gardens are an act of resistance and much more than just gardens. And it was a really interesting discussion and it's still there available on our, um, our Facebook page. And I would ask you to, to tune in and listen because I think it gives you a really 
valuable insight into how we can engage those who are sometimes not the people that are uh, traditionally engaged in the climate conversation so I would definitely tune in if you get a chance and, and have a look at, at, at that as well so um, as Pamela and Kathleen mentioned, eco exchanges, again, this was wonderful to be able to tap into this COP26 conversations fund, uh, which was developed in partnership with Museums Gallery Scotland, Historic Environment Scotland, and the Scottish Libraries and Information Council. So um, we knew that books best way to spark conversation. So we were really excited. Uh, and as Kathleen said, there's such wonderful um, writers out there who are, you know, uh, writing about climate and, and, and the effects and, and, you know, stimulating these conversations. So we've, we have three um, eco exchanges. The first one we've had already was with Lindsay Littleson, who's written The Secrets of the Last Merfolk. It was aimed at children. And again, we were streaming it live on Facebook. We have Samuel Tung on uh, Monday, just coming up, um, and he's doing a creative writing workshop. And again, taking the River Clyde as the main point. So we're, we're, we're using those kind of local references as well, um, as well. And he does a lot about spoken word and poetry. Um, and also there'll be a chance for those who come to the in-house session to, to try out the virtual reality headsets as well. And um, again, that was, um, that's geared at, at, at young adults and then our final event we have Alistair McIntosh who Kathleen has as well who's written the wonderful Riders on the Storm and again he talks passionately about um, you know how we go beyond the technology economics and conventional politics and deepen our humanity so we're looking forward to that on Tuesday the 9th of November as well and just to let you know everybody who's on this call you can join as well because we are streaming all these events live on our Inverclyde Libraries Facebook page now unfortunately I mentioned that just earlier but our first event <laughs> um, was a bit of a disaster because of course it was the one day that Facebook went completely down so unfortunately we couldn't stream it live but we have a recording which we will upload in the near future. Again, our programming is still developing. Book Week Scotland. We have Leslie Riddock joining us again, but she's working with a different demographic from our area, which is the HMP Greenock. So we often run events for the prisoners. And I know yesterday's event with the British Libraries, I always spoke about, you know, uh, the climate change is a collective action problem and we can't do it alone. We need everybody to be involved, absolutely everybody. So uh, we thought it was really important that um, when talking to the, 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 the learning services at the prison that who were doing some work on climate change that again they got the, the uh, opportunity to join that climate conversation um, a, a, as well. Um, along with that, we are having a, a celebratory feast as well with um, library staff are going to be uh, taking library recipe books out um, and they'll be uh, uh, doing a social media a campaign on, you know, cooking and, um, you know, showing how they can reuse and, and recycle and use every bit of a vegetable to create a dish. And we we will be doing that on social media as well, along with a climate character com converse competition for the under 12s, creating a climate character as well, which will become part of an Inverclyde climate story, which again will be available to borrow during borrow box. So that's kind of the, the main big strand about our programming that we're looking at. But as Kathleen said, there's a huge amount of work um, to be done looking inward. Um, so we're looking at this as an opportunity to embed green practices into our work. You know, we're using this as an impetus to write and to tap into the council's sustainability strategy and, uh, and write an action plan in line with the new public library strategy for Scotland. As Pamela had mentioned, you know, you know, it's very much the sustainability, the global sustainability goals are very much embedded into our, our public library strategy. So I think, you know, there is an opportunity there to look at what we, we currently do. What we did to kind of drive this forward and to look at the action plan was to create a green team. So this was made up with the of uh, this is made up currently with a cross section of library staff who will work on this and um, hopefully promote green working practices within our libraries and further stimulate climate conversations with our communities as well. So our whole, you know, um, 
idea is, is uh, as Kathleen mentioned as well, is to kind of reduce the environmental impact of our day-to-day -day operations, our make our buildings as green as we possibly can and minimize the consumption of resources um, and again we're doing a big campaign called small change makes a big difference as well so there's lots of little things that we can do um, and again you know when talking about creating a green team and looking inwardly i would say you know there is a lot of resources out there not just the Silip School Green website, which is excellent, and 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 the and the resources that are there, but again, um, you know, Creative Carbon Scotland have a huge amount of resources. I mean, I looked at that because they supported the Green Arts Initiative in Ireland, and again, there was fantastic resources out there for anyone who's working in libraries, you know, um, that that you could avail of and look at. I would well recommend that you do your research before you start anything, because again, you can get tips and hints from. From those who have gone before us and again power of partnership the power of working together is, is wonderful as well so please do look at that and another really good website is the IFLA's um, Green Library Award and again there's a, a lot of resources there that you can look into and tap into as well and you can also see the recipients of the awards in the past and see how you know they've made those little changes that we can we can look at as well we're also very lucky in in engaging with our green team as well and um, I spoke to our council's carbon reduction officer and he was able to give us um, you know our baseline for our impacts our, our climate impacts our energy usage our waste produced our water used our travel stats and our carbon footprint as well and it's only by measuring these impacts at the beginning of our journey that we can benchmark our progress and again he said to us you know our buildings as, as Kathleen mentioned are our biggest you know creators of emissions and there's a there's there's not much we can do about this but he said there can be uh, you know a reduction in waste to landfill or energy usage and this will be a real and visible achievement for our organization and an incentive for our staff to maintain the investment in time and resources in running running a green team you know and again you know we work in partnership with with the other um, uh, agencies within our council as well so um I'm nearly at the end of, of, of this as well. We're also looking at that green space I mentioned uh, at one of our libraries and creating a reading garden as well. And our green team are going to, to, to lead on that. And we're hoping that our chatty cafe networks will, will take, will take, a, a, take a, a, a big role in that. You know, we've had lots of expertise from both Bruce Newlands in the men's shed, Belleville Community Garden, and we're hoping to grow vegetables, plants, and have this lovely outdoor space where people can sit, read, read and join into many different kind of opportunities to explore and uh, learn about their environment as as well so i'm i'm nearly at the end um so I just wanted to say that i think there's a huge amount of work that libraries can do i think we can stand strongly for environmental sustainability, social equity, cultural richness and community participation in our own local regions. I think, you know, in preparing and relocalizing our community and making it vibrant, resilient and truly sustainable in the face of, of climate change is a role that we can really embrace. I think we can keep developing our environmental collections, resources and learning materials. And I think we can be involved in advocacy and matters relating to environmental sustainability, social equity, cultural richness and community participation. We can facilitate uh, adoption of sustainable living within the community by promoting environmental education and networking locally, nationally and glo globally. You know, I think my hope is that as Inverclyde recovers from the pandemic, the focus on climate related services, activities, events, literature, projects will de demonstrate the social role and responsibility of libraries as leaders in environmental sustainabilities. I think our green team feel really confident that they can inspire our community into a more environmental environmentally sustainable ways of action and by leading by example we can make small changes that offer a discussion forum in the language that our community speaks and I'm just going to leave you with this lovely quote if you have a garden and a library you have everything you need so if you want to contact me my details are there thanks
Oh, Ali, what a, a great call to action and a lot of love for that quote in, in, our, in our community. It's just fantastic. And it's really, I mean, it's, it's inspiring. It's also quite moving, I think, to realise just how deep this work goes and the impact this is having. So thank you so much for sharing all of that. Sean, have we got about I've got a minute or so for questions? Yeah, yeah, we'll, we'll, we need to wrap shortly, but that was perfectly, perfectly timed, uh, Kathleen and Ali and, and Pamela, so thank you all, that was really fascinating. So, uh, and thanks for the reminder, as a former employed employer, I forgot about the word galoshes, so uh, thank, <laughs> thanks for that reminder. Uh, yeah, and, and it's so good to see not only the work and sharing information that libraries are doing, but also linking up with other departments and organisations, so much going on, so thank you for sharing. Uh, we're at 12 now, if anyone does need to go, then obviously head off and you will share the recording. Uh, we, we've had lots of, lots of comments um, sharing different links and, and things like that, which we'll share afterwards. Just one question, so we'll just do that quickly um, before we, we wrap up um, from Roger. Roger was asking, um, great things happening, what, is there anything, you know, thinking going forward that you're doing to measure the impact of, of, of what you're doing more, more longer term, you know, either Ali or Kathleen going to come in on that? Well, I suppose, I, I sorry, um, just to say for the green team part of it, again, we're measuring our impacts, you know, tangibly, basically, with with working with the carbon reduction officer on that. Again, um, we are evaluating all our programs to see the impact. And again, we will be working with our partners. Um, and also, you know, sustainability is built into all our programming. So the hope is that these programs will continue long after COP26 uh, and, and into the future as well. Um, I think for, for us, the power of, of this kind of convening has given us a, a new level of partnership, which is amazing, you know, so I, I, I do think, you know, um, a, you know, definitely we will keep trialing and keep looking and evaluating as we move forward. Thank you. Yes, sort of similarly, we, you know, we, we're sort of checking, you know, audience numbers and engagement numbers and things like that. Uh, but long term, I think we're looking at, uh, we, we're doing our forward plan now, which is going to be sort of inspired by the, the sort of national strategy that's just been been published. And as part of that, we want to do a consultation, and I think that will help us engage sort of impact and awareness maybe with library users and non-users, and that will be a way of measuring it long term if we, we keep that going. Um, yeah, I think it's something we need to think about also keeping and having that sustained so we are showing that there is that impact. Thank you. Yeah, so really, uh, just looking at the time, there's, we'll, we'll wrap up there. So just to, to say, you know, to echo what others are saying, very interesting, absolutely fascinating. Uh, and it really was, and I've learned so much there. So thank you to all our speakers um, that have been involved today. Thank you to everyone else that, that attended. We'll send out links to, 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 to various things in the recording and things if anyone wants to catch up later or share with any of their colleagues, because the more that we can do to, to share this work, uh, the, the better to, to inspire others. Uh, so without further ado, enjoy the rest of your Fridays, everybody. Thanks again to the speakers and have a lovely weekend. And thanks from all at Phillips. <laughs>